It is officially noon in Memphis and 10 a.m. in sunny La Jolla, California, and I guess Portland, Oregon, and wherever else yeah. uh, everybody is. So welcome, welcome to, uh, I think it's our 12th OPAR webinar, is that right, Laura? 12 is, I think, the magic number. Yes. Um, so the, we have um, 11 background uh, webinars for, for Abraham Palmer's presentation today. They're easy to get to. Just go to opar.io and there's a link to all of the previous webinars that uh, will, I hope, bring you or your, your co colleagues up to speed. Um, today, it's really great to have uh, Abraham Palmer from UC San Diego um, speaking to us about the, as you can see from his presentation, uh, first slide there, the NIDA Center for Genome-Wide Association Studies and Outbred Rats. Um, so Abraham uh, started his career, at least his, his uh, graduate career at UC San Diego and uh, working in cardiovascular genetics with uh, Mort Prince who was then one of the preeminent rat geneticists. Uh, he imported Michael Provnick's HXB BXH RI rats to San Diego and rederived them all there many moons ago, uh, an amazing uh, effort. And um, genetics since he was uh, a young guy, then he did a postdoc at Oregon with many, many of you are presumably on here. I haven't looked at all the uh, participants, but with Tamara Phillips and a great team at OHSU, which is still a great team at OHSU. So it's really one of the world centers. Um, and Abe had a, his first, first position as an independent faculty at the University of Chicago. And at that point, he did something which is extremely um, rare is he established a very effective collaboration looking at the genetics of uh, amphetamine, amphetamine abuse uh, with, with the wit in human populations. So I think the hallmark of Abraham, the thing that impresses me most about his career trajectory to date is that he has managed to do what John Crabb calls conciliation across human cohorts on the one hand and animal model genetic cohorts on the other. And he's continued to do that. Um, he's uh, an amazing collaborator. I don't know how he multitasks it, uh, but he, he does. So he, and he's a, a great motivator and catalyst for many of us, myself included. Um, so it's a real pleasure to have him show us in this presentation, just exactly what that consilience between you know, when you hear the acronym GWAS, you think human. So here he's taken that idea, applied it to a cross that he'll tell you about, which is as close as you can get in a rat population to a human GWAS. And it's really a remarkable effort. It's been funded as a P50 for, for about six years now. Um, and I wish it could go for, for 20 years uh, but the way this is structured, unfortunately, this, uh, is that this is the five years. Uh, the, the, the next five years are the critical five years. But so, so Abe, take it, take it away. Yeah, uh, great. Thanks a lot for that introduction, Rob. Um, so I'm going to start off by giving an overview of the center and sort of what we're doing and what are sort of the key components of those activities. But then I hope that there'll be at least 20 minutes towards the end where I can really show you what we're producing in some detail. And in particular, we've developed kind of a format for reporting on results from a wide variety of traits that are being studied in our lab. Uh, and so I'll actually go through one of those reports and kind of highlight the way that report is organized and how that reflects our thinking about what you do with the results of a genome-wide association study. And by the way, Rob and Laura, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm assuming that our audience feels confident about what a GWAS is. Is that a fair assumption? I think that's a good assumption. Okay, terrific. All right. So as Rob said, we have a P50 center uh, uh, for GWAS and outbred rats, and that's what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, this was started in 2013 or 2014. Uh, 
And at that time, most of the quantitative genetics related to substance abuse and, and frankly, most traits was being done in mice. So if it was being done in mammals at all, it was being done in mice and not rats. And I had spent several years thinking about how to do some of the cool phenotypes that were done in rats and how you could port the phenotype over to mice. But gradually, a, a competing idea occurred to me and many others, and that was maybe instead we should bring the tools of quantitative genetics that had largely been developed in, in mice and move those over to rats so that we could move the, the genetic tools kind of to the uh, animals where the phenotyping was being done, where some interesting phenotypes were being done. Um, so I do not mean to say that people shouldn't be doing phenotyping in mice, that there's a lot of value in that also, but our focus has been trying to take tools that were developed really also in humans, I think, um, as well as in uh, uh, mice and to bring them over to rats. And here's an early paper with some of my kind of co-conspirators uh, on that topic. So in order to do that kind of work, one of the key things we needed was a genetically diverse population. And again, Laura and Rob, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'll bet they've been hearing about the diversity outbred population in mice uh, and other outbred mouse populations. No, we haven't covered that yet. So maybe a little back. Oh, terrific. Okay. Well, so what we needed was genetic diversity. <clears throat> that is, we needed a population where not all of the individuals had the same genotype. Now, one thing that I'm certain you've been hearing about in these previous talks is the use of panels of inbred strains as a source of genetic diversity. That is, you have a bunch of different inbred strains, they have different genotypes, you could then phenotype those individuals and correlate the known genotypes of those strains with the phenotypes of the individuals and identify regions that were uh, correlated. Chromosomal regions, maybe ultimately genes that gave rise to phenotypic differences in the uh, inbred panel. The other major approach, though, and the approach that much more closely parallels what's done in humans, where, of course, panels of inbred strains wouldn't be available, is to use outbred populations. And in principle, you could go and catch a bunch of rats in the New York subway system or something, and you could use that as your outbred population to do phenotyping and genotyping. Practically, there's a lot of reasons you might not want to do that, including that they'd be really dirty and probably very aggressive animals. Um, and so instead, what's typically done is laboratory populations are used. And in 1984, before a population, well, in 1984, uh, at the NIH, eight inbred rat strains, which are shown here with their uh, abbreviations, were interbred, were mixed specifically for the purpose of developing an outbred population that had alleles from these eight different founders. And you can imagine it takes a few generations of crossing, but after not very long, uh, you've mixed those eight inbred strains, and you have a population of outbred individuals where at any given locus, a given individual might have inherited uh, one of their alleles, say, from this founder and one of their alleles, say, from that founder. Mm. And if you had uh, a means of genotyping, and we'll talk about that in a few slides, if you had a means of genotyping these animals to figure out for each individual what was their genotype at each of many loci across uh, chromosomes, you could then associate those genotypes with phenotypes that you had measured in those animals and potentially identify associations that were so strong, so significant that you thought they weren't due to chance alone, keeping in mind that you're doing a lot of tests because you have a lot of different loci that you thought were so significant that you didn't think they were due to chance alone. And you would then be interested to know what is it about that chromosomal region that changes that phenotype. Maybe there's a coding polymorphism there. Maybe there's an expression or a regulatory polymorphism there that uh, then at a very molecular level changes something about how cells, proteins, cells, brain regions, and ultimately behavior uh, is produced. Yeah, okay, so here's a nice practical uh, question about the size of the population and how that relates to maintaining genetic diversity. That's gonna come up in a few slides. Uh, in fact, it comes up on the next slide, look at that. So in 1984, this population was started and they had 60 breeding pairs and they were using a random breeding approach. And that went on for some time. And around 2003, they were transferred to Ava Reedy at Northwestern where she had a much smaller colony. This is smaller than I would have suggested, but obviously there are budgetary constraints that govern how big of a colony one can have. That colony has subsequently been expanded in the hands of Leah Solberg Woods who continues to maintain these animals and is the only person in the world maintaining this population. So around 2006, it was expanded to 46 and 64, and I believe now it's at 92 breeding pairs. So we have a substantially larger population. Um, 
And just recently, in fact, in order to protect this population because it is so unique, uh, Leah worked with the RRC to freeze down thousands of zygotes from uh, 75 breeding pairs so that if some disaster like COVID or a hurricane or an earthquake or any number of disasters that sometimes could lead to the loss of a animal colony were to occur, we would have frozen embryos from which we could rederive this population. All right, so here, I hope this movie is gonna work. Here we have a, a slide that addresses what happens to a population like this over generations. And I, I maybe I didn't say it out loud, but we're now at about generation 92 or 94 of this population. And so Dan, oh, is it not gonna work? Here we go. Yeah, Dan Monroe, who's a postdoc working with me in Pejman, um, Haudati, uh, did some simulations to think about what would happen to both haplotypes and genetic diversity and recombination density over the course of 100 generations. And you can imagine that in reality, so, so this simulation assumes that there's no genetic forces acting, that it's just random chance that's leading to both recombination and changes in allele frequencies. In reality, there could be some selective things going on because it could be that there are some alleles that are preferentially transmitted or not, but we're not assuming that in this simulation. And what you see is that uh, across the chromosome, there's a change in entropy, that is the genetic diversity. Entropy overall goes down with uh, time. And that is to say that there are some uh, haplotypes that are going to low frequency or even being lost. But critically, what happens to the segment length that is, there's more and more recombination happening with each generation. And so the length of these haplotypes is dropping over generations. And that's the reason that we'd like to go out a lot of generations is we wanna break up these haplotypes, which at the beginning of our movie, I wonder if I can do this. At the beginning of our movie, they're haplotypes that span the entire chromosome because they're coming from inbred strains. But you see very quickly recombination breaks those up into smaller and smaller pieces so that uh, the haplotype, the segment length is getting lower and lower. And that's the critical thing about an outbred population like this. If we had a very small number of families in the breeding scheme, we would have a great loss of entropy. That is lots of chromosomal regions might get lost from the thing and the population would become increasingly inbred. So we need to maintain enough families to avoid that while still accumulating these favorable recombinations here. So I hope that that addresses some of the questions that I was seeing in the chat. So uh, I've alluded to several times the need in any GWAS study to genotype the animals. Uh, in human genetics, genotyping is overwhelmingly done with genotyping microarrays or SNP microarrays. And because they sell millions of these a year, the prices for them have been driven down and it's a very inexpensive uh, and reliable way to genotype the animals. There is not a similarly inexpensive microarray. In fact, there's essentially no practical microarrays uh, available for rats. And at the beginning of this center, we considered developing a microarray, but one of the limitations of microarrays is that they have to be designed with knowledge of the polymorphisms that you expect to find in the population. And they're only useful for that one population. We wanted to have an approach that could be used across different species potentially, and certainly different populations within a species. So something that would be good for the HS rats, but maybe we could also use, for instance, for Sprague Dolly rats or other outbred populations. Um, and so we, for many years now, almost a decade, have genotyped animals by using sequencing-based approaches. We also thought that over the next period, we expected that the cost of sequencing and the quality of sequencing data would improve dramatically. And so we kind of hitched our boat to sequencing and we've used sequencing of the genome. Now, obviously, if you sequenced it 30x, you know, a high coverage in order to get confidence calls at all SNPs, it would be extraordinarily expensive. And so instead, we've used various uh, approaches to do much less sequencing and then use imputation to figure out what the genotypes are. So until recently, we were using a genotype by sequencing approach. We've actually published protocols for this where we use restriction enzymes and we subsample about 3% of the genome and then sequence that at higher depth. And based on those regions, we'll encounter polymorphisms. And based on our knowledge of the founder haplotypes, we could then impute polymorphisms across the genome. More recently, we've shifted gears and we now do whole genome sequencing, but at very low coverage. So whereas 30X is what you might use if you wanted to definitively identify polymorphisms in an unknown individual, 
we're using 0.25x, so much lower, about 100-fold lower coverage than that. That means most polymorphic sites are never sequenced in a given individual because we have less than 1x coverage. But because we can share data across many individuals and because we know what the reference haplotypes look like, we can very effectively and accurately impute genotypes. And this is an approach which is similar to approaches now being used in, in humans and other populations. I saw a paper just today about doing this in cattle. So here are some of the people that worked for years on genotyping by sequencing. Uh, and I think there's no reference here, but I could give you a reference about that. And then here is the new protocol. This is Riptide. It's a protocol that comes from this little company called iGenomics that happens to also be located in San Diego. Uh, and it's just a very low cost way of preparing uh, whole genome sequencing libraries. And then there are a, a series of bioinformatics steps that we've also developed in the lab. Okay, so I've tried to give you uh, uh, the first of two overviews, very high level overview of what we're doing. But I wanted to briefly just reiterate, so we have this center. The center is using rats and not mice. It's using outbred rats, these HS rats. I'll be talking entirely about HS rats for the rest of the talk. We're using next generation sequencing to genotype the animals. As I'll tell you in the next many slides, we have various behavioral domain experts that we collaborate with. And so an essential part of the center is that there are people like myself who are doing genotyping and analysis, there are people like Leah who are producing animals, and then there are many, many people who are experts in phenotyping and who are doing the phenotyping of the animals. We aim to get very large sample sizes, and I'll talk about that throughout the talk. Uh, and then we integrate other kinds of omic data, particularly gene expression data, but other kinds of data at the genomic scale in order to help us understand what it is about chromosomal regions we identify that's important. And finally, as I'll emphasize at the end of this, we've developed a kind of a report format, a very standardized way of presenting to collaborators the information that we generate. And that's because whether we're analyzing bone density or uh, a microbiome trait or a gene expression trait or self-administration of cocaine, for us, a lot of the steps are identical. We have genotypes, we have phenotypes, we're looking at associations and we're bringing in other corroborating information to help us understand those. And so for that reason, we've developed this report format so that uh, those steps that ordinarily a person might have to do over and over by hand are, are now completely automated. It's a lot of information on our website, and I'll put that URL up a few more times. So the key things about the center are uh, the ability to produce rats by Leah, the ability to phenotype the rats by many, the ability to genotype the rats here in San Diego, and then the ability to analyze the uh, correlate correspondence between genotype and phenotype. And I won't dwell on it, but here is an org chart where you see producing animals, phenotyping animals, I'll talk about this more, and then uh, genotyping and uh, analyzing them. And so in the initial five years of the center that Rob alluded to in the introduction, we had three uh, core phenotyping groups. One was Terry Robinson and Shelley Flagel looking at Pavlovian condition approach. One was Hao Chen, and one was Jerry Richards and Paul Meyer. Uh, I'm sorry, Hao Chen, I should have said, is looking at nicotine IV self-administration. And when I talk today, I'm actually going to use the elevated plus maze data. So he looked at several different anxiety-like traits before the animals got any nicotine. And it so happens that the plus maze is a convenient set of traits to look at for the uh, uh, demonstrating the reports. And then here we have Jerry and Paul looking at a variety of different traits uh, including some very sophisticated behavior like delay discounting uh, and reaction time and other kinds of things. I should say Jerry has subsequently retired and David Dietz now leads uh, uh, sort of a continuation of this project. And I'm going to uh, largely skip over this except to say that the center has been renewed and we're doing some new phenotyping and then we're continuing to expand the sample size for some of those phenotypes. And we now have brought in Trey Eidecker, who's helping us with network analysis, though I won't talk about that today. And uh, only to say that in the new iteration of the center, now we have Paul Meyer independently running one of the projects, and he's looking at intermittent access cocaine IV self-administration. All right. Uh, one of the key things that we've built uh, sort of as we started this center is a relatively sophisticated database where we can track all of the information that we have about animals. And so that information would include their relationship to other animals based on a pedigree. That would include phenotypic information we have about the animals. 
uh, often stored as raw output from the uh, phenotyping uh, uh, software. And so rather than taking just the process phenotype, we take the raw phenotypes and then build macros within our database to extract what we think is the right phenotype. And that gives us the flexibility to change our thinking about what's the right phenotype. Um, and we have genotype information, which I've alluded to several times. For some of the animals, we have other kinds of information like microbiome information, gene expression information, micro uh, uh, metabolomic information, et cetera. Various kinds of data are stored in that database. And I should say that we also do a lot of QC as we work with the groups that are generating that data so that when we get a new uh, tranche of data from them, we carefully examine the data to see is it similar to data we've received previously? Are there outliers that we need to be addressed that need to be addressed and resolved, et cetera? Uh, so there's a lot of, of work that goes into that database. And that database, because it's not human data, that database is something that I could literally uh, you know, put on a flash drive and, and mail to somebody uh, without a lot of procedures. Now, in fact, we do have a procedure to talk to the people who are generating the data to make sure that they consent, but these data are shareable. And there are a number of groups now that we've shared the data with who want to look at it in uh, uh, different analytic frameworks that are beyond what we're doing. Uh, key elements of the center, as I've said, are, are uh, Leah's ability to produce HS rats and our ability to genotype and analyze them. And based on that sort of backbone, those key core activities that our center has, we've uh, developed a lot of collaborations with labs interested in physiological traits. So by and large, these are labs that want pieces of dead rats because there are things that they can measure in these pieces of dead rats. Uh, that are interesting to them. And a number of those have led to funded grants. And uh, this information is available on our website. And I'm not going to read through it, except to say that a lot of these are great productive collaborations that really fully utilize these animal subjects that we've already uh, uh, done a lot of behavioral work with. And now we can do a lot of additional research with the same uh, animals. And it's also allowed us uh, to obtain a number of additional grants that go beyond the funding of the P50 and this is allowed in particular using these U01 mechanisms uh, from NIDA that some of you will be familiar with, has allowed us to start collaborations with a variety of other phenotyping experts, domain experts, that are doing additional phenotyping in separate populations of HS rats, uh, looking at other phenotypes that go beyond what uh, we were funded to look at in the P50. And so in total now, we've secured funding to phenotype and genotype about 16,000 of these HS rats. Uh, over a variety of different phenotypes. So the, really the scale of it is, uh, uh, at least to me, a little bit dizzying given uh, where we started and uh, the history of similar projects. Uh, we have a lot of gene expression data, and I've alluded to that a few times. And when we get to the reports, you'll see how we use some of that gene expression data. But we have a lot of gene expression data, some of it generated by the P50, some of it generated by uh, R01s and, and U01s. Um, and this is mostly brain data, you'll see. So a lot of different brain regions, including we've just done half brain recently in a relatively large population, uh, because we think that may actually be a good way to kind of juice our power without um, limiting ourselves to specific brain regions. Some of these samples are from animals. It's not indicated on this slide. Some of these samples are from animals that have undergone treatment, including receiving drugs. That obviously changes the nature of the results that you're going to get. But a number of these are samples that come from naive animals. And we tend to argue that naive animals um, are preferable because what we're really interested in is genetic control of gene expression prior to exposure to any drugs. So what is it about the animal that on the very first time that they received drug was already different because they have different gene expression regulation, genetically governed gene expression regulation? We use that data to try to enhance uh, the core activity of the center. So again, the core activity is to associate SNPs, polymorphisms at the DNA level with phenotypes. Those are QTLs. You can call this process here a GWAS. You can then also associate those same SNPs in animals where you've measured it with gene expression, transcript abundance. And those we typically call eQTLs. So they're QTLs, but these are expression QTLs. And we can then use these two kinds of information in concert with one another. And we'll see that in the reports. But we can ask if the SNP is associated with a phenotype, is that SNP also associated with regulation of one or more different transcripts, often but not necessarily transcripts that are near to that implicated chromosomal region? 
And if it's true that the SNP is both associated with a behavioral phenotype and with expression of a gene, we might then hypothesize that this is actually the pathway that mediates the association with the phenotype. That is the SNP's ability to regulate transcript abundance is the causal thing that changes the phenotype. And because we're doing this work in model systems and not in humans, whereas Rob indicated, we also do a, a fair amount of GWAS in human populations. In humans, there's no straightforward way to manipulate a gene and see whether or not manipulating that gene changes the phenotype, obviously. But in rats, that is something that we can and have done. We can manipulate the gene by making knockouts. We can manipulate the gene with viral vector strategies. We can manipulate the gene by using small molecules that might target some function of the gene when those are available. So we can do various kinds of manipulations and test that causal inference. Is it true that manipulating this transcript changes the phenotype? And that would support the association that we find here. So this is really the core of the thinking of the, uh, uh, of the center. Briefly, to give you a flavor for some of the additional projects that have been developed out of this, one of them is run by Peter Kalivas, and they look at uh, uh, heroin self-administration in rodents. And you can see this is a long and intensive protocol where the animals have uh, extensive access to heroin over many days. And we look at uh, escalation, we look at uh, with progressive ratio demand, we look at extinction, we look at reinstatement of a variety of different uh, phenotypes. Uh, and yes, I'm going to say some animations that I'd forgotten were here. I'm not going to talk about it in so much detail. In another project, we're looking at cocaine IV self-administration. This is one of the relatively more advanced EO1 projects. This is with Olivier George, who was previously at Scripps, but uh, happily now is at UCSD. Uh, and Giordano uh, is one of the uh, uh, lead people within uh, Olivier's group who's working on this. And you'll see here that these animals that have long access to cocaine over a number of sessions, we find uh, uh, impressively a sort of a bimodal distribution whereby a minority of the animals do not escalate their cocaine intake, even after they have extensive opportunities to do so, whereas the majority of animals shown here do escalate their intake over sessions. That's obviously a very interesting and provocative difference. We know among humans, probably the ratios are flipped, but we know among humans, many people will use cocaine many times and only a small fraction of them will escalate their intake and, and become dependent and have a, a, a serious problem. And that's of course true for, for all drugs. Alcohol may be the most familiar to this audience. Um, and so it's very interesting to have a population where there's really a, a, a bimodal distribution. I might've assumed that there would be more like a continuous distribution here. On the gene expression side, Francesca Talese and Graham McVitter are uh, leading an exciting project where we've gotten into single cell RNA-seq and Jessica Zhou is a graduate student who's actually doing a lot of the, the hands-on work where we're looking at single cell RNA-seq gene expression. So most of what I talked about was bulk. That is we cut out a tissue and we grind up the tissue and we look at the RNA that we find in the tissue. Here first the uh, cells are sorted and then the RNAs are, are barcoded before their sequence so that we can tell where we know uh, which sequences came from an individual cell. And then using various techniques, those cells can be grouped based on their gene expression profiles. And in many cases identified based on uh, particular characteristic uh, genes so that we can start to look at where gene expression is different at the level of different cell types. We can also start to look to see whether or not there are uh, QTLs that govern the relative abundance of different cell types. Maybe those QTLs, uh, if they exist at all, would also influence behavior. And so maybe the modification of behavior would not be so much by more or less expression of an individual gene, but by greater or lesser uh, abundance or ratios of one cell type to another. So that's something that is being explored in this UO1. And then most recently, another UO1 that's going to allow us to go beyond SNPs. So the focus, as you've heard me say, of all of our genotyping is on SNP polymorphisms. But we know that those are only one. Uh, albeit commonly studied, but only one of the kinds of polymorphisms that exist among any population, human or animal. Uh, other kinds of important polymorphisms are tandem repeats, which have been understudied until recently, but Melissa Gimrick here at UCSD uh, has started her lab really uh, focused on developing methods for the analysis of tandem repeats and shows in humans that tandem repeats, expansions and contractions of them uh, seem to be causally related to about 15% of gene expression polymorphisms. So they probably have a 
significant impact. Because they're more mutagenic than SNPs, we anticipate that we are unable to completely tag them with our current genotyping protocols. That is, no SNP might be a perfectly informative about the uh, tandem repeat. And so it's important to actually identify the tandem repeat specifically. And also working with Jonathan Sabat under the same grant, we're looking at structural variants. So these would be uh, deletions uh, and duplications that might uh, act on part of a gene or all of a gene or regulatory regions of a gene. And we find that there are a lot of these structural variants in uh, both mouse and rat populations. And so we're characterizing those. And we believe that those will also be causally uh, responsible for some of the polymorphisms that we see. And I threw this slide in here just to say that we're doing this in um, the HS rats uh, here, but we're also doing this in other populations, including inbred rat populations, uh, inbred mouse populations, and outbred mouse populations. So this is a project that will characterize these tandem repeats and structural variants across a variety of different populations and make that data available. So there may be people on this call that don't work in rats, and much of what I've said may not seem like it touches directly on your work, but this, I hope, will touch directly on your work. Uh, and we hope to be providing those uh, over the coming uh, years. So uh, to reiterate, we have uh, the ability to produce rats. We send them to now a variety of different phenotyping centers. Uh, and then we have a, a, a mechanism for analyzing that data. And that's what I'm going to be talking about in the next many slides. So we think of this kind of as an ecosystem where there can be a lot of interaction among these projects. And in particular, as you'll see in the reports, loci that are implicated in a trait in one project may also be implicated in other traits that are measured in other projects. And that kind of pleiotropy across projects is of great interest to us. And similarly, we can look at genetic correlations, that is whether or not overall genome-wide similarity among animals uh, leads to a correlation in phenotypes. And we can do that across traits that are measured in different centers. That is, we can do that for two traits, even though that the, both traits were never measured in the same animals using the techniques of genetic correlation that are commonly used in human genetics. So this is a little bit like a mini All of Us in, uh, uh, project, where the All of Us project is a, a major initiative to look at a million human subjects and to get genotype and extensive phenotype information in them. OK. so. Uh, we have already gotten well into the phase where we're analyzing the results from these genome-wide association studies. And so here's the first of many Manhattan plots that I'll put up just to remind people that don't spend all of their time looking at these. We have uh, the different rat chromosomes here across the x-axis. Each dot represents an individual SNP polymorphism that we look to see whether or not it was correlated with a trait or not. Uh, we have about 3.5 million polymorphisms that we're considering in this particular figure. And we plot them on the y-axis according to how strongly they were associated with a phenotype. And it's the minus log 10 of the p-value. And that's just a convenient way to make it so that more significant results, lower p-values, go up in this thing, because it's a little more intuitive, I think, to think of them as being more significant. And so that way, that's what you see here. Here's a threshold for genome-wide significance. This is based on permutation analysis. We could talk about in the question and answer session, uh, but I won't say anything more, except that we need to have some way of controlling false uh, positives given that we're doing millions of tests. And so the permutation analysis allows us to do that. And what you'll see is there are some extremely significant associations that are orders of magnitude above the threshold for significant. There are others that live right around the threshold for significance. We have here different um, body composition traits. So BMI, body length, and uh, actually particular fat pads that were taken post-mortem and weighed from these animals. And you can see, as we would have expected, that there are some loci that are associated with multiple different uh, body morphology traits. So those would be pleiotropic loci, where uh, whatever it is about that region actually affects several of these things. And you can see that there are a number that also seem to be more sporadic and more specific for individual traits. These data were published last year. And uh, by using more than 3,000 animals in the GWAS, it was certainly one of the largest, I think, non-human mammalian GWAS ever, ever published. The heritability of some of these phenotypes is, is very high. I won't say a lot about heritability until oh, I'll say nothing about it until we get to the reports. How's that? Having such a large data set allowed us to do something that we hadn't done before, and that is to imagine, well, what if we only had some of this data, not all of the data? And so here I'm plotting different sample sizes, this being the actual sample size of that study, 
And these being different sample sizes that we can simulate simply by subsampling that total sample size so that we randomly subsample it to smaller samples. And we can then ask the QTLs, significant QTLs, would we have discovered if we had actually worked with a smaller population of animals? And so in this case, for each of these three different traits, here's the actual sample size. There are no error bars because that's the total sample. And then we considered, well, what if we subsampled to only 2,500 of those animals? And we can do that 100 times, different subsamples. And that allows us to get a sense for the error bars around this. And as we subsampled the data for three different traits with varying heritability, so kind of high, medium, and low heritabilities, we saw that there was not a linear relationship between the number of animals and the number of significant loci that we discovered, but actually an exponential relationship where there seems to be an exponential growth of the sort of returns or the findings as you go to larger and larger sample sizes. So this is different than the kind of power analysis that many of us are familiar with, where we do a power analysis, how big should the sample size be for my genetic study based on my desire to find at least one uh, association that exceeds my threshold for significance. Here we can ask the different question, which is, what are the implications for the number of significant associations as I grow my sample size? And you can see from this that larger samples are attractive and that larger samples would give you more findings per unit animal, if you want to express it that way, or per unit dollar, the number of findings would actually be exponentially growing. And therefore, in a certain sense, it might be more efficient to have larger sample sizes than smaller sample sizes. And that influenced our thinking in the renewal. And I think you saw that we have some samples that we're trying to grow up to about 3,200. This, by the way, is an observation that was well known to human geneticists already. And what they find is that as you go up and up, you go through a, a, a flat phase. And you can see that there would have been a long flat phase here where we would find almost nothing. You then have an exponential growth phase. And then there's a long linear phase. I don't think in our studies we've gotten into that linear phase yet. But it doesn't continue to be exponential forever. Obviously, it couldn't because there has to be some limit. There seems to be instead a long linear phase. And presumably, there must be some point at which this asymptotes. And that gets into some discussions uh, that I will not uh, have time for. OK, I see some questions in the chat. Surprising low for fasting glucose. Yeah, it may be that our measurement for fasting glucose wasn't optimal. We were just using those commercial test strips that a diabetic person would use to look at fasting glucose. So one thing that can limit the heritability of a trait is the, the quality of the measurement. And it may be that uh, we uh, were being too simplistic in our approach to that. It, it, it does give a quantitative reading, but it may be quite noisy. OK. Um, as it turns out, uh, Leah and Michael Garrett had known before we started any of this behavioral work on uh, HS rats that about 2% of these HS rats are missing a kidney. So this is what an animal is supposed to look like when they're dead and you open them up. They have two kidneys. You have two kidneys, too. Uh, here's what they look like when they're missing a kidney. One of the kidneys just isn't there. It's kidney agenesis. Uh, so as we've been doing this study, we've been opening up all of the animals at the end and just counting whether they have one kidney or two kidney, a very simple phenotype, obviously. Uh, and so we had about 5,500 animals at a certain point in time where we knew whether they had one kidney or two kidney. As I said, only about 2% had one kidney. Uh, and so we were then able to do a GWAS. And this was a little bit unusual in our hands. Most of our GWASs are for uh, quantitative traits that are continuously distributed. Uh, here, where you have a case control situation, common in human genetics, some individuals are, are, are cases, they're missing a kidney, some individuals are controls, they have both kidneys, and you have a very skewed ratio of cases to controls, you have to actually use a different approach for the analysis. And so using a package called SAGE that was developed for human genetics, uh, Joel, who was here on this previous slide, a postdoc in my lab, has now done an analysis and identified chromosome 14 as clearly the uh, only significant locus for this. And there's a complicated story here that Joel is putting together. This corroborates work that had been done using uh, F2 and congenics in these animals. Uh, but now we have a large enough sample size that we can start to look at um, epistasis and other kinds of uh, factors. Uh, and I think because I'm a little behind where I wanted to be in time, I'm going to skip over this except to say that Amelie Baud a former postdoc in my lab now starting her own group in Spain, uh, working with Rob Knight here at UCSD. We've measured microbiome in more than 4,000 of these animals. This is actually the microbiome in the Sika using 16S RNA sequencing. 
We have a very large sample there, and we can look at host genotype and how it might influence the microbiome. We see effects there. We can also look at microbiome and how it might be associated with phenotypes that were measured in these same animals. All right, so the reports. I promised I would look at the reports. And I now need to do something which is very intimidating, and that is I need to switch which screen I'm sharing. So I think I do something like new share, and I go to two. Great. And can you guys now see this? No, I don't know if you can. Oh, I have to share. Uh, that didn't do what I thought now it would can. do. We can see it now. Okay. Do you see this report, elevated plus maze at the top? Yes. Oh, you do? Yes. Oh, wow, OK. Um, terrific. All right, so here is a report. And these reports have been developed very intensively, in particular by Purva Chiche in my lab, um, uh, but with a lot of input from a lot of people. And so this is going to be a report on one of the phenotypes that Hao Chen measured in Project 2. Uh, and that's elevated plus maze. And I think many of you are going to be familiar with elevated plus maze. Elevated plus maze is a test that's intended to uh, look at anxiety in mice and rats. And it is a, a plus shaped maze with two open arms and two closed arms. An animal feeling anxious might spend most of their time in the closed arms. An animal feeling less anxious might spend most of their time in the open arms. We know that a pharmacological, genetic, uh, and uh, neuroanatomical manipulations that would be expected to modulate anxiety uh, show up on this test. And so, uh, though it's not perfect, it's widely used test to look at anxiety like behavior. And how used it, I believe, because he was interested in the relationship between anxiety and nicotine self administration, which was the primary thing that he was studying. So, we start off just by the date that we did this, the source of the data. Here we have the trait descriptions. Uh, it's been a lot of work to come up with descriptions that should be human understandable for these things. And we're now working with a lot of encouragement from Rob and Alyssa on uh, getting ontological definitions for these so that gene ontologies could be applied to these data sets. But suffice to say, we have a number of different traits here related to the animal's behavior in the, uh, the plus maze test that are described at least somewhat here. These animals all came from Tennessee. There are males and females in about equal numbers, and this is the total sample size. The age distribution is shown here. You can see the age is pretty normally distributed with a few uh, outliers there. Uh, and now we're going to look at these traits. And as you saw back here, there are a number of traits. And so we're going to look at the distribution for the traits. And some of them have what I would consider to be pleasing, relatively normal distributions. That's encouraging as a, a trait to analyze. Some outliers here, which we can remove. Some of them, however, and this is one that I'm going to uh, use as kind of a straw man. This is center time late in the session. And you see it's extremely skewed, where most of the animals actually have the lowest possible value. Um, and so it's very badly skewed. With all of the traits that we process through this particular pipeline, we do what's called a quantile normalization. So we take the rank of the animal in these distributions, and then we apply that to a perfectly normal distribution. And that way, we don't have any concerns about non-normality. However, when there are ties, that is multiple animals that have the same value, in this case, there are multiple animals that must have the value 0, uh, the ties are broken randomly. And that means that, in this case, most of that uh, quantile normalization will involve randomly assigning these animals to different parts of the left portion of that uh, normal distribution. Obviously, if the data are random, they shouldn't be heritable or informative. And so this is a trait that uh, really there's no uh, kind of a transformation that can save a trait where most of the animals have the same uh, floor or ceiling value. All right, other traits. You can see some of them have uh, nicer distributions than others. <clears throat> now we check to see, and this is all done in an automated fashion, we check to see if their uh, age is a significant covariate. And we can specify other covariates uh, in this also when we uh, run one of these reports. Uh, so for instance, to see if they're, uh, uh, I think sex is typically uh, included in these also. And there are a number of other possible covariates that were specified having to do with like batches and the time of testing and the experimenter and the box in which the animals were tested. Uh, but it turns out that none of those explain much of the variance. So none of those need to be treated as covariates here. Now we get to estimates of heritability. Some of you are familiar with the concept of heritability. Just to reiterate, heritability is whether or not the trait is influenced by genes. 
Uh, some things might be not heritable at all. That is, your genotype is irrelevant to your phenotype. Some things, for instance, coat color alleles tend to be perfectly heritable and might have a heritability of one. Most things will have some intermediate level of heritability. Uh, you see here we have heritabilities that are ranging uh, from around three or even four down to essentially zero. Okay, And it's important to say these are SNP heritabilities. So these are heritabilities calculated from all of the SNPs that we've genotyped. Uh, very common approach now in human genetics. Many of you will be familiar with heritabilities expressed as the heritabilities that you get when you look at a panel of inbred strains. That actually turns out to be kind of analysis, uh, analogous to the heritability that a human geneticist would get from a conventional twin study where they had identical and non-identical twins and looked at the relatively greater concordance in identical versus non-identical twins. Those give higher heritabilities. There are a variety of reasons for those higher heritabilities, but these uh, heritabilities should not be directly compared to the heritabilities you would get from a panel of inbred strains. They're expected to be lower. But you can see that a trait with a high heritability versus a trait with a low heritability, we might expect to uh, be more productive to study a trait with a high heritability versus a low heritability. Here's one of the more recent features that we've introduced. Here we look at genetic correlations. And so, as I said, this is a method for looking at the correlation between two phenotypes that could be studied in the same or different populations of animals by using all of the genotype information about the animals to figure out which animals across the two phenotypes are most similar and least similar, and then to ask whether or not those genotypic similarities predict phenotypic similarities. And so that allows us to look at correlations that are driven entirely by genotype. They wouldn't include environmental factors. Driven entirely by genotype, correlations between traits measured across all of these different projects that you've seen in some of the previous slides. There are a lot of traits here. So you can see there's many, many, you know, uh, hundreds of traits here that we can look at the correlations of. And typically what we might do is sort these. So here I've already sorted them to have the highest minus log p values. This is around 10 to the minus 10 p value, highly significant genetic correlation. We also have the R squared. So how, how uh, shallow or steep is the correlation? And now we can look at what is the uh, trait that's correlated. So in this case, I've eliminated all of the traits that Howe had measured. And we're only looking at traits that were measured in one of the other centers, in this case, New York. And you see that the uh, time spent in, uh, open in the, on the plus maze is strongly correlated with a variety of locomotor traits here. So I see a bunch of different locomotor measures here. And I believe if we go on here, we see some more, uh, we start to see some impulsivity. So here we see very significant still, so that's a 10 to the minus seven kind of correlation, very significant correlation, somewhat less magnitude, but these are correlated with measures of impulsivity in these animals. And so that's a potentially interesting uh, finding there that we might explore further. And there's a, there's a lot there, but I obviously don't have time to unpack all of it. Here now, we start to summarize the uh, associations, the GWAS that we've run for these traits. And we look at the results of those GWAS. And you'll see that for some of the traits like uh, 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 frequency and entries into the open arm we might, or closed uh, arm, we might see multiple associations. For others of them, we see only a single association, and it's not highlighted here. But if you go back to the heritabilities, here you'll see certain traits with very low heritabilities, like center late. Uh, we don't have any significant associations for it, and that's what you'd expect, because if it's not under genetic influence, it would be surprising if we found an association. It gives the size of the interval, and you see some of these intervals are quite small. Other intervals are, are quite large and the number of genes that are in each of those intervals. Here are some Manhattan plots. And so again, let's look at the um, terrible center late. So this is the one that had a heritability of essentially zero. You see that nothing is significant for that. And you see that for some of these other traits, we have uh, one or more uh, genome-wide significant associations that go well above our threshold for significance. And the next section of the report will zoom in on those regions. And so whereas this shows us all of the associations we got across all of the chromosomes and how significant they were, now we're going to start to look at zoomed in uh, views of particular regions. So this, I'll tell you, is an ugly one. I'm, I'm uh, showing it first because it's first in the report. But this is an ugly one where, in fact, even over a six megabase region on chromosome 13, we see kind of a uniform level of significance. So this must be a very large haplotype 
we're not able in this case to localize this genetic association to a small interval. Um, and it, uh, and so I won't talk a lot about that, I think. And instead we'll go on to the next region. So now this is um, closed late in the session. So on chromosome 14, we see now this is a much more focused association. So an association that really seems to highlight just the one megabyte interval on this chromosome with a limited number of genes under that. We're working on a number of different mechanisms to identify or to kind of delineate what are the confidence intervals. Uh, and I'm not gonna say much more about that now, except that that's sort of an active area where the, um, these reports are, are currently evolving. For this association, this purple is the most strongly associated SNP and that's its position on chromosome 14. We might be curious to know for that particular most associated SNP, what is the frequency of the two alleles in this population that we're looking at? So that SNP has two alleles, C or T. The allele frequency of the first allele, the C allele is very high, approaching one, okay? Uh, the C allele originally came from, it looks like four of the different strains, but, and so it should have had a, a frequency we might have expected of 0.5, instead it has a frequency of 0.96. So either due to drift or maybe even some active selection process, the frequency of this allele has changed quite a bit over generations. We sometimes see this, I think it's the exception rather than the rule. We sometimes see this. We can see that in that same uh, interval, there are two moderately severe coding polymorphisms in genes in that interval. And uh, here are the coding polymorphisms. These are amino acid changes. And I think that's all I need to say about that. Oh, and the R squared. So what is the correlation of this coding polymorphism with the SNP that was most associated with the uh, plus maze behavior. And that's given here, and you see that it is literally one and it is essentially one for this one. So those are very tightly linked to this SNP, which was most associated with the phenotype. And that's consistent with the idea that they might be actually the cause of this association. That is the reason that this region is associated with the trait is that this uh, SNP is a marker for these coding polymorphisms that may change the function of the gene in a way that influences the behavior. Uh, we also report in these reports, and skipping forward slightly, actually, actually, yeah, we also report in these reports uh, correlations between the most associated SNP for that phenotype, that is that purple SNP that I've been pointing to up here, and other traits that have been measured in other parts of the center. So it might be the same uh, person, how Chen's data, or it might be data from other uh, parts of the center to see whether or not there are other traits that seem to be influenced by the same QTL allele. And that can sometimes help us think about what does it really mean, for instance, if we had a sophisticated behavioral trait and it was associated with a region, but we saw that that same region was also associated with say just locomotor behavior or some relatively fundamental aspect of behavior that might change our thinking about how that region was asso uh, associated with uh, a difference in the, in the sophisticated behavior. That is maybe it's associated with that because it changes locomotor behavior and that may in a not very specific way change the behavior or that may be very interesting uh, depending partially on how you view uh, for this example, the significance of locomotor behavior. Here, when I sort these to see what are the strongest associations, so the strongest R squared between this SNP and other traits, I see that none of them are very high. The R squareds are low, 0.2. And so I would say none of these are probably interesting to talk about further. Here's a third region on chromosome 14 at a particular position. We see a strong association. Again, this is about a one megabase interval. And we can see that it's clearly different from the surrounding SNPs. I probably should have said earlier, but the color coding here indicates the R squared between the most associated SNP and the nearby SNPs. So the red indicates that the R squared is very strong. That is, these are strongly associated with one another. Probably they come from uh, the same haplotype block that was in inherited from one or more of the founders of this population. And then nearby it drops off very steeply. So these SNPs are not as strongly associated. And also they have a corresponding lower R squared. That is, this SNP here is not very good at predicting genotype at these SNPs. And that's the reason that these SNPs don't have a strong uh, uh, p-value for, for association with the SNP. So in this case, 
a visual test, I think, is probably sufficient to identify this as being the most interesting uh, area to pursue further. And you'll see there's a few genes in there. And I happen to recognize the clock gene in there. That's one of the uh, genes that's associated with circadian rhythms in these animals. And sometimes uh, one of the things that I do at least is look to see if any of those genes are, are known to me. Here again, we're looking at the allele frequency. This is modestly rare. One of the, the A allele is uh, present in about 10%. And we can see that the A allele came in from just one of those eight founder strains from the Brown Norway strain. One of the eight founders had an A there, all the others had a G there. So this frequency is about what we'd expect. The input frequency of that allele would have been 0.125 if it was 1.8. And over all these generations, it's shifted slightly to 0.104. Now we're going to look at uh, putatively causal coding variants. And you see, look at this gene clock, which I just mentioned. With full disclosure, I had already looked at this report, so I knew this was going to happen. Here's this gene clock, and there are lots of coding polymorphisms in the clock gene that you can see here. And significantly, their R squared is almost one with the most associated SNP. And so we know from that that these are strongly associated with the QTL. They may be uh, individually or, co or collectively causally related to the QTL, that is some difference in the clock gene is leading to a difference in behavior. And because of this strong R squared and the fact that this region came from only one of the eight founders, I can say with pretty high confidence that these are polymorphisms between Brown Norway and the other seven founders. We haven't formally tested that, but that's very likely the reason that we would see those two things. Here we're going to look at, uh, so this we're calling a FIWAS, and I've mentioned this before, we're going to look at the association of that most associated SNP with other phenotypes that have been measured in other centers. And you see that there are two relatively strong uh, associations uh, with uh, traits that were measured by other people. One is the light reinforcement task from Jerry Richards, but this is not really light reinforcement, this is light reinforcement before uh, it's the activity of the animal before the test started. So this is probably uh, related to general locomotor activity. And similarly, in a social interaction task, it was the total distance in that social interaction task. So this SNP does seem to be corroborated. It really does change something about behavior in an independent sample. What it changes seems to have to do with activity, maybe in some kind of a novel environment. And here is the much longer list of traits that are associated when we uh, consider the R squared between uh, our peak SNP and the R squared between a lot of other uh, traits that have previously been mapped. And you see, again, we get a lot of this light reinforcement. And then precipitously, those R squareds drop from being almost one to being very low. And so traits that have low R squareds, that's telling us that there's not much of a correlation between the SNP for this phenotype and the SNP for other phenotypes that have been associated, even though they fall within the same three megabase window. See a lot of, of comments coming in. I'm almost done with this report, and uh, then we can uh, go into the discussion. Here's another relatively small focused association that we see. Uh, this is the duration in the open portion of the uh, uh, open field. I don't think there's a lot I need to say here because you're becoming familiar with the kinds of information that we get from this. Here's another very focused association identifying a, a sub megabase region. Happens to be a relatively gene rich region, but luckily we're focused on a very small part of that gene rich region. There are a lot of coding variants that are associated with this, including one that's a stop gain. So that's one that you might really want to look at. That's a, a premature stop in the gene. And so that could uh, be a gene killing mutation, a loss of function mutation. Uh, I certainly don't know much about this, and so uh, uh, this is something that somebody might want to evaluate further, including by clicking on this link to go to more information about that. Here we see, uh, well, let's see, no, I think I'm going to skip through some of this and skip through some of this. Here's another ugly one. So we certainly do sometimes get these very big associations. Uh, this is implicating a large region, a region that doesn't have many genes, but still it's going to be harder to say with confidence which of these genes, either uh, coding or uh, expression polymorphism in these genes, which of them are really going to be causally related to that. Here's a nice example, though, for an EQTL. So, and this will be almost the last thing I say. 
Uh, I had mentioned earlier that we're looking at a lot of gene expression traits in this population. And what we do with those gene expression traits is we try to identify SNPs that are predicting differences in gene expression and those we call EQTLs. I said that before and some of you are familiar with that. This is a portion in the report where we can look to see, are there any EQTLs that co-segregate with this uh, QTL, with this associated with the region that's associated with behavior? And here we see that for this gene, REC, it's an exciting sounding acronym, but I don't know much about it. For this gene, REC, in all five of the brain regions that are included in this report, we do see really strong, highly significant associations between that uh, a SNP, which is almost synonymous with it, so a SNP that has a very high R squared with it, uh, and the expression of this gene in several different tissues. And so that's telling me that one of the things that might cause this region to be associated with behavior is that this region is also, and in the SNP in particular, is also strongly associated with regulation of this gene REC in a variety of different brain regions that may be relevant to the trait. And so that gives me a, a, a handle on, even though this is a big interval with a number of genes in it, that gives me a reason to think that maybe I would particularly be interested in looking at REC as one of the genes that might be uh, causally related to it. And I think I have one last thing I wanted to show you. So this is yet another associated region, kind of modest sized region. And when we look at the traits that are uh, associated with it, so here we're looking at the FIWAS. These are other traits that also show associations in that same chromosomal region. We see that not only do we get a high R squared with plus maze, kind of the same trait, of course we would, and with novelty seeking, a different test, but getting at some of the same factors, uh, but we also see a lot of correlations with nicotine self-administration behavior. And that was one of the other things that uh, Hao Chen was measuring in this population. And we even see some uh, associations with things like social reinforcement and Pavlovian conditioned approach. So this is an example of a region that is associated not only with this relatively simple uh, elevated plus maze behavior, but with a lot of other more sophisticated paradigms. And so it may be interesting to understand what is causing this association because it may be the key to understanding how a difference in this region influences a variety of different behaviors, some of which may be correlated, some of which may be related in our mind, but all of which are kind of unified by the fact that something about this region influences those behaviors. And so I'm gonna stop there at the end of the hour. And Laura, if I understand the format correctly, we're now gonna do a discussion and I see a lot of questions have come in. It's been exciting to look at the chat bot. That's, that's somewhat distracting. Yeah, yeah so, so this, this part's reserved for discussion. Go ahead, Rob, I was gonna turn it over to you. Oh, okay, um, yeah, I think great great presentation, Abraham. Thanks, thanks so much. I'd say there are three major questions from, uh, or I'll say general questions. There's yeah. a lot of chat from me you can ignore, but the, the three, Questions that I think are most important. Um, uh, Marty McBride had a question labeled at 12.51 PM, at least online, probably 10.51 for you. How do the yes. GWAS results compare to human GWAS? And does that help with priorita prioritizing functional SNPs in humans? And, and Marty, if you want to join, uh, just unmute yourself. And anybody who wants to unmute themselves, go ahead. Hi, hey, Marty. You're still muted. There you go. Great talk, Abe. That was fantastic. Brilliant. Uh, thanks. Yeah, so does it help us with, you know, prioritizing SNPs in the human GWAS? Yeah. Um, you know, you may not have got there yet, but... We are doing things, so it, it doesn't feature very prominently in the reports yet, but we are thinking about that in a number of ways. And you can imagine the most straightforward is uh, a region, or maybe we even have a favorite gene within that region in some rat study. And you can ask, well, does that same SNP come up, or that same gene come up in any human GWAS study? keeping in mind that a human GWAS study, like a rat study, implicates a region. And even in human GWAS studies, those regions often contain a few genes. So you can't say with high confidence which gene is causal in the human. And you have the same problem on the rat side. That obviously complicates the, the activity that we're talking about. Nevertheless, if I was trying to sell you a story 
And it turned out that there was a gene in my region associated with nicotine self-administration, and it was also associated with nicotine use in humans. I would probably mention that. Um, but it may not be the most rigorous way to do it because uh, of the things that I just alluded to and because of sort of the, the um, almost publication bias you have there. How many different human traits did I consider before I found this one thing? How many different genes in my interval did I consider? So other ways that we're thinking about that are, can we do it in a more polygenic way? Can we take a lot of genes, even if we're not confident that the individual genes are truly causally uh, responsible for the associations, but can we take a lot of genes that we find, uh, say in this rat study, and then relate them to a lot of genes from a human study, maybe using methods that allow for both the significant associations, but even sub-genome-wide significant associations on the human side. And that's one of the things that we're doing with Trey Eidecker. I don't know if anybody from Trey's group is on the uh, call, but in the recent reiteration of this uh, center, we added a project with Trey Eidecker, who's a network biology guy. Um, and so he has a lot of methods for kind of comparing sets of genes that you might get from two sources. And sometimes those are from like yeast to hybrid systems, you know, very different kinds of sources. But he's become interested in GWAS also. And so we're using these, this network space to see, can we take a list of genes we get from the rats, a list of genes we get from the humans. A simple question is, are there some of the same genes in that set? And are those same genes, you know, more than you'd expect under chance? That's certainly worth reporting. But we can then uh, use the network space where we know what are the relationships among these genes to ask a more sophisticated question. And that is, are there particular regions of the network that have an unexpected number of hits from those two data sets? And that's done with techniques like heat diffusion and other kinds of approaches that are, are really trace expertise. And we do have some really encouraging preliminary results from those studies, suggesting that we are seeing uh, significant enrichment for those kinds of traits and that that enrichment seems to be quite selective. That is traits that we think should be related to one another are, but if we take a random negative control human trait, we don't see that. And if we take a, a random negative control animal trait, we don't see that. So it does seem to be significant that we've chosen the right traits. And that's uh, an important question because there's a lot of reasons when you get two sets of genes that you could introduce biases that would tend to show enrichment. Um, for reasons only of bias. So for instance, we've worried a lot about gene length. Uh, we also know more recently are worried about the subset of genes that actually have orthologs between rat and human. And it may be that that's a special subset of genes and that may pollute some of these approaches also. So Avery, Marty, maybe that's more of an answer than you wanted, but. Question from Cameron. <laughs> okay, uh, Cameron, are you, are you online and able to ask it directly or do you want me to read it? Yeah, I can ask it directly. That's great. Hey, Cameron. Hey, how's it going? So I'm just curious, like, do you have any examples of validation in rats yet? And if so, like, how do you choose, like, do you choose a high and a low rat and do the reciprocal gene editing, or do you model it on a mixed HS background? Or yeah, both? that's right. Um, so in the cases where we've done it so far, we have done the easy thing, which is you have it on an inbred strain background and you look at it. And as you know, it's very plausible that there would be modifiers that would be background specific. And so if you put it on an arbitrarily selected inbred background, you might lose the effect uh, even though your finding was true. So that's a hazardous thing to do. The breeding necessary to introduce a polymorphism into a heterogeneous stock background and breed appropriately so that you know everything not linked to that modified gene is segregating randomly is, a, is possible and a little bit of a headache. It's something that Amelie Baud has thought a lot about and I think wants to really pursue with vigor, um, but that's more challenging. The, the other thing that I should say is the best follow-ups are uh, where you have a pharmacological follow-up. And we do have a nice story with a lot of collaborators where we identified a region for Pavlovian condition approach that seemed to be associated with the TAR1. There are a bunch of TAR receptors there, but uh, Tamara Phillips and others have done a lot of work on TAR1 in particular. And we were able to get a drug that was a TAR1 agonist or antagonist, I don't remember right now, and saw that that did change Pavlovian conditioned approach behavior in an HS population. When you have pharmacology, you can do it in the right population. And so that's a kind of an exciting result that we need to uh, uh, write up and, and present. And I, I think you, I'll mention viral factor question? also is another way it. that you could manipulate the gene in a heterogeneous stock background without having to worry so much about breeding. Go ahead, Rob. Uh, just Jeff, Jeff French, you 
why don't you? Oh, the question was um, when you're, if you're on. doing these, uh, am I unmuted now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rob, you're breaking up a little bit, but I think everybody can understand who you're calling on, but just so you're aware. Okay. Uh, hey, hey uh, thank hey. you. A great presentation. And, and I'm okay. drowning in data now. So um, I was interested in when you look, consider the animal to human correlate. Yeah. And, the, and that some of those phenotypes are more or less operationally defined. How yeah. well do they, do the GWAS in them and the rats correlate with the GWAS in the humans? I mean, is that straightforward or what you, you have to do some manipulation? Um, so maybe I'm going to ask you to be a little more specific. One thing you might be asking is, are the phenotypes in rats really similar to the phenotypes in humans? And that I think is- In, in essence, that's the question. Is that the question? Yeah. That is the $64,000 question. And I realize that's not a lot of money anymore, but that is the key question. Um, we don't know. I mean, that is a major assumption on the part of most of the people on this call who work in animal genetics is that the phenotypes that we're studying are in fact relevant to the human phenotypes. I would assume that some are more relevant, more similar, and others are less relevant, less similar. And I think one of the things we can do with data sets like these is we can start to actually ask that question. And some of the things that we're doing, for instance, with Trey Eidecker might be one way of asking that question. Absolutely. Do we have evidence? And that is desperately needed evidence. You know, if you think back to kind of the principles of behavioral uh, uh, neuroscience, you could have face validity. We all know to be pretty scared of face validity. You could have predictive validity, but in many cases we can't have predictive validity because there may not be efficacious treatments. You can have construct validity. You know, so there's different kinds of validity, but a, a kind of validity that doesn't exist yet is genetic validity. And it may be that if we can use polygenic information from a trait as studied in an animal population and pair it with polygenic information for a trait studied in human populations, we could, uh, we could have a novel kind of information and that would be that there's a, a genetic evidence that this behavior or this trait in animals is related to a trait in humans. Yes. And I'm sure that there will be winners and losers if we're able to get something <laughs> like that to work. And I don't Quite know if life. the signal will be strong enough for that really to be useful but I think that's a very exciting direction and, and some of our thinking is along those lines. Very good, thank you. Sure, sure. It's, it's funny, it's almost comical how careful we have to be in answering a question like that era of Josh. Yeah, you're saying Josh Gordon, I think, yeah. I wanna point out that this is not like a whole damn book about. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's, you know, my, my gut wants to just say, Obviously, they align perfectly. <laughs> you know, not quite true, but but that's where my gut wants to take me. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a major concern, and not just for behavior. And so, if we could come up with methods that would validate and maybe even allow us to discriminate between the better and the worse models, that would be really, really useful. Another limitation of the human genetic side is that they tend to measure things like is the person uh, you know, diagnosed with alcohol use disorder or not. Whereas we tend to study many individual components, each of which we think are important for alcohol use disorder. So when there are more specific phenotypic data available from humans, so maybe cigarettes per day is a nice example, where it's a much more specific phenotype about how much nicotine individuals are using uh, and kind of the pattern of nicotine use, those may be easier to work with on the animal side because the, the uh, human genetic phenotype is more closely approximating the kinds of things we would measure in animals. Hey, could you get Sus Susanna's question and then we'll come back to um, yeah. Mark's question? Struggling with lumping versus splitting for behavioral measures. Thoughts on advantages and disadvantages. Suzanne, can you come on and tell uh, lumping and splitting could mean a lot of things. I'm, I'm, don't want to answer the wrong question. Um, okay, so hey, I, hi. I heard it was Lovely mailing in Portland, Oregon. Is that true? Uh, yeah, earlier, but, but okay. you know, wait five minutes. Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, I guess I was thinking about um, the relationship between some of these measures, uh, for example, the elevated plus maze, um, and, and the idea of trying to perhaps use principal components analyses right. to, to create sort of a, well, a, a, a meta trait um, versus thinking about um, 
uh, about more molecular traits such as, um, you know, um, sort of uh, general locomotor activity and things like that. And when we're thinking about the fee was, it seems like, you know, you could get very different um, different results if you thought about sort of more meta traits mm -hmm. versus more molecular traits. And, and I just wondered what your philosophical approach deal with this in this humongous data set? Philosophical approach. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I have one. Uh, practical approach. Um, I think you're exactly right that when you have a data set where you know that, and, and it's not plotted in that report, but we know that those different phenotypes we've measured, many of them are strongly intercorrelated with each other. They're not actually that independent. And so of course you'll then see things like, you know, you could call it pleiotropy where two traits that are very highly correlated identify the same locus. Is that really pleiotropy or is that just that the traits are correlated? It's a, you know, who knows? Um, we have looked at uh, principal components. And in fact, we've done some work with principal components in particular when we were looking at Pavlovian condition approach and a former graduate student in my lab, Alex Galetta, uh, did that kind of working with Shelley and, and Paul. Um, it has pluses and minuses. Other ways to do that are polygenic or uh, multiple uh, phenotype GWASs. So you can actually just put in, you can have multiple different phenotypes when you're doing the GWAS. And then more recently, particularly in human genetics, we're playing with approaches like genomic structural equation modeling, um, where you could have different, you know, the same SNP could have different loadings for different uh, traits. Um, and so there could be a lot, kind of a lot more flexibility as opposed to a principal component where you force everything into one component, but that may be a good model for certain SNPs and a bad model for other SNPs. So we are interested in doing things like that. And, and you're exactly right that when you have so many different traits, in a way you'd like to reduce them to a smaller number of, of hopefully more interpretable traits. Um, and so that is something that we're working on. Uh, it's not really reflected in the reports yet, I guess, but the reports are sort of a, a backbone. If we had a principal component or other way of doing something, the, most of the report format would be able to fit that also. Thank you. Yeah, sure. That's a great comment, Suzanne. It's something that's very much on my so mind. Heard... They're all good comments, by the yeah. way. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Rob, you're breaking up. Is he breaking up for everyone else or is it just- Let me a, just ask one more yeah. statistical question to keep among the- um, So yeah, this has to do with the way you handled the tie breaks on the low end. Yeah. And I'm just wondering whether that actually works when you have uh, you know, several hundred zeros in your data set. No, it, yeah, that's what I tried to highlight. No, it doesn't work. Um, I mean, when you have set, when most of your values are zero, there's not a lot you can do, honestly. You're, it's just not a great trait to study. Clearly, breaking the ties randomly isn't even an optimal solution for that. Um, it's, that is our first approach. And so that's what these reports implement. It's the automatic thing that happens is we're gonna just apply the quantile normalization. We break a bunch of ties in a way that's not very defensible and we go forward with it. Of course, you can then say to the person generating the phenotype data, look, this is a problem. There's nothing that we can do about it, but you may want to tell us, what do you think is the meaning of this phenotype? Maybe we want to compare zeros to non-zeros and make it case control. Maybe we even want to eliminate ones and we kind of want to you know, compare zeros to tens or mores, if that's possible. So that you know, then some thinking has to go on. The, the format of the reports is intended to um, automate a lot of the things that we would other have, otherwise have to do kind of on a piecemeal basis for a lot of different consumers, but they're definitely a starting point and there are often follow-ups that you wanna do after. Yes, nobody should go home thinking that I have endorsed the idea of breaking ties when 80% of your data are a tie. Um, as you saw, that led to a heritability of essentially zero and no genome-wide significant results. So maybe the data are not salvageable, but certainly we didn't salvage them that way. There are a few more questions in the chat. Marty, you yeah. want to ask your second question? Yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah. Abe, is, you know, is anybody, of course, this, this might be limited by the original founders, but, but is anyone looking at kind of ASCLA phenotypes? Aha. Uh -huh. um, 
I don't know that it would be eliminated by or limited by the original the founders. We don't have SHR in there, you know. I mean, so there's that. Uh, well, um, I, yeah, I cannot. I've always thought, why is that? You know, why was that never done? But yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, 1984. So 1984. I was, yeah, yeah, I was yeah, alive. Still back I can't then. hold me yeah. responsible for what happened in 1984. <laughs> um, uh, I don't think we do have any cardiovascular work being done in these animals, and it's funny because, as Rob said in his introduction, that was sort of the first uh, exposure I had to genetics. Um, I certainly would be amenable to it. The easiest physiological collaborations involve pieces of tissue. I don't know, yeah. for, for cardiovascular, I would tend to think of blood pressure uh, and that requires so, some apparatus. So and, the reason I mention that, Abe, yeah. is, is that from the, previous effort, uh, from the previous effort from the HS, yeah. I believe that Dell and I still have the hearts and I the see. vessels from the 1400 odd animals. I see. Yeah, now, yeah. It was really, it was really interesting what you showed there with the sample size. Because, yeah. you know, we worked with about half of what you guys are working with. And, uh, I, you know, it, it was very interesting, the, the, the curves there. So maybe it's a bit of a limitation. But the other thing that we did that was about unusual was that we ground the hearts so that uh -huh. we could take, uh, you know, in theory, we were thinking of multiomic sort of approaches. Yeah. So we have, you know, we've got 1400 ground hearts that we could do lots of different types of analysis with. So yeah. we should and maybe talk further about that. Yeah, I would love to follow up with you. I don't think I realized that something like that existed still. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So oh. that's something we'll, uh, we'll talk about. I'll need to check the details exactly. Yeah. I'll definitely be in touch. You, you should something. do that, Marty. You should forge ahead yeah. 250. According to Dr. Liu, who's on on the on our uh, webinar right now, you can for about two hundred and twenty five, two hundred thirty dollars per sample, they'll do the RNA extraction for you at Nova Gene, Nova Seek. I keep getting that wrong. Nova Gene, uh, or Nova Gene, yeah. For for I think forty million reads is the deal that Lulu has. So okay, uh -huh. wow, yeah. wow. That, and that's a bit cheaper than our central core facility. Yeah. Yeah. All of the genotypes are in gene network from from Amelie and Jonathan's uh, work, and you can yeah. extend it to uh, to the to Abe Abe's uh, HS today. Yeah. Yeah, that would be terrific. I'm going to jump in and that interrupt sounds... because I really want to hear your answer to Spencer's question about can you talk about the Let's next see. five years of Rat GWAS will look like and what the main future directions or anticipated challenges will be? The next five years, that is a great question. Um, you know, for us, we're in the production phase, right? We have a lot of studies that are ongoing. Some of them started pretty recently. And so we're gonna be increasing dramatically the sample size. Um, you see in the reports kind of a reflection of what do we think are the right things to do with that data but they certainly don't capture all of the right things to do with that data. I alluded to the question of how do you relate it to human genetics? And, and you know, I think we had a good conversation about that already. Um, we don't have any uh, protein work right now. I know that Rob is gonna suggest PQTL in, you know, some, somewhere between seconds and minutes from now. So that's certainly an interesting uh, possible direction. We've also thought about metabolomics. You can think of different kind of omics level things. I didn't, uh, harp on it, but one of the things that Francesca Talese is doing is ATAC-seq, and so that's another kind of an omic data that you can bring to it. So I think trying to stitch together those different things will be an important future direction. I think Cameron alluded to a key future direction, which is how do you follow up on these studies? What are going to be the, the right, most efficient, most scientifically defensible ways as you have candidate genes to think about following up on them. I, I think that's something that's, you know, we're working on. Obviously we have some of the obvious ideas about, but I, I don't know that the book is closed on what are the best ways to do that and to balance kind of the quality of the study with the efficiency of the study. So I think that's another important area for growth. Uh, so Abe, sort of following yeah. up on Spencer's question, um, uh, you're, you're good. Your good buddy Cameron has thrown you some some big questions at the very bottom of the screen. Like, yeah. where are we going? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I do think that as we uh, continue to produce these data sets, 
the real mark of success is, do we do studies based on their results? And so I alluded to something that we started a little while ago with TAR1, where we were following up on, a, on an association and doing a study to see, is that true? And then if it is true, are we able to get real neuroscientists? And it might be the people doing the phenotyping or it might be other neuroscientists. Are we able to get real neuroscientists interested in pursuing these results? Some of you know, I've had a longstanding interest in this gene GLOW1 that originally came from sort of a genetic discovery kind of a study. And we've done some real biology on that and learned some things that might be interesting. One of the things that I think many human geneticists would uh, endorse is that there is a limited examples of how the products of human GWASs are being pursued by neuroscientists. And there's a great cartoon that somebody has with sort of a wall taller than the people. And they're the geneticists dumping all of this data over the walls of the neuroscientists. And the neuroscientists are sort of puzzling over the things that have been thrown over the wall because they're not quite sure what to do with them. So I think having better integration, better handoff of the things that we're finding and making them accessible is really important. The reports might be one small piece of that, but we need even better tools to make sure that the things that we think are interesting can be pursued. That said, I think things that are discovered in a rat or a mouse are much easier for experimental neuroscientists to work on because they work in rats and mice. Things that are discovered in humans have the big additional challenge that other than cellular models, it's not clear how to pursue a, a gene discovery uh, in humans. Is that the kind of answer you were expecting or not? Kind of. Yeah. I was just more, I was kind of more asking like, you know, you're working with these heterogeneous rats. Um, what, what's the future based on what we've learned from, from mouse forward genetic approaches? Um, you know, are, is it a good idea to think about making rat CC lines or is it a good idea to oh, think I about see. rat DOs with wild derived rat alleles or not? Or, you know. Yeah. Well, so a key resource that, that um, Laura and Rob and Mindy and, and others are involved in that I haven't mentioned at all is the development of inbred rat populations and it's the hybrid rat diversity panel. So um, one of the strengths of mice is that there's this place called Jackson Labs that you're very familiar with uh, that has lots and lots of inbred strains and has made a, a business of, of selling and supporting those inbred strains. And there has not been something as vigorous in rats and I'm, I think there probably still isn't, but having a lot of available inbred rat strains is really important to the broader ecosystem. It is one, I mean, it's a resource you can use for quantitative genetic approaches but it's also a resource that has a lot of other advantages. That is developing now, developing pretty rapidly. And I think that's a really positive thing. And, and uh, you know, many of us are talking about what are the best ways to take advantage of the possible synergies between an outbred and inbred populations. And just to give a quick plug that we, in a couple months, we will also have a webinar about the hybrid rat diversity panel. That's great, yeah. Laura, I see Any us other? being two minutes from the hour. Questions? Comments? I think we answered, got most of the chat um, questions answered. Yeah, okay. I'm just throwing into the chat my email, but uh, I think Google is pretty good at finding me. So it seems. So I would love to hear from people uh, following this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Abe, for taking the time to present with us today. For those of you who want to share this presentation with colleagues,